Uh, welcome. I'd like to, first of all, thank Jessica for that beautiful introduction. And Doug, thank you so much. And I'd like to thank Middlesex School for uh, hosting this uh, gathering. And thank you all for, for coming. Um, it's really an honor, actually, to be connected with the mindfulness program at Middlesex School, which is really a unique and wonderful um, opportunity for the students here to actually get immersed in mindfulness and for the Inward Bound Mindfulness Education Program, uh, which is really uh, a revolutionary program for our country to really make opportunities available for adolescents to really uh, develop mindfulness on a, in a retreat setting. Let me find out a little bit about you before we get started. How many of you are here as adolescents? Raise your hand if you're here as a somewhere between 12 and 24 years of age. Okay, that's great. Well, welcome, that's fantastic. And how many of you are here as adults who once were adolescents? <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Um, so that's the amazing thing about the adolescent period is that whether you're an adolescent learning about it or an adult, it's actually relevant to you. And especially if you're involved in a relationship between adolescents and adults, uh, it's a very special moment uh, in life. So what I'm gonna do is talk to you a little bit about this notion of Brainstorm, which is uh, the, the name of this book that my daughter named, actually, who is a 19-year-old. Uh, and I have a, also a 24-year-old. And in helping them get through the adolescent period uh, and still be in it, actually, um, what struck me was that what was available for us as parents or available for adolescents in the popular literature was stuff that wasn't actually quite accurate for what science was telling us this period was all about. Uh, and so as I went through being a parent of teenagers and then in their early uh, 20s for our son, uh, I really wanted to dive deeply into the scientific literature to see what's actually known. And then the contrast between the myths that are out there and the science was so striking that I thought it would be important to put that out there uh, and when I was talking to my kids about it, it really became clear that there was nothing available for an adolescent, him or herself, to actually read about that period of life that was deeply going into what's really going on. And then when I looked even further at the books that were out there, there was nothing for both an adolescent and an adult to read and actually share with each other. They may not read it together at bedtime or anything, but they could at least read it separately and then have a conversation about it. So I decided to start looking into the science, looking into the literature, and put that together in this book. And I wrote it up and sent it out to some teenagers, sent it out to some parents, got their feedback, rewrote it, edited it, sent it out again, got their feedback, rewrote it, until finally it's the final version that's out there. And it was literally the hardest book I ever wrote because to find one voice for both adolescents and adults to relate to was really a challenge. And some of my friends would say, why don't you just write one book where on the even pages you write to the adult and on the odd pages you write to the adolescent, which sounds like a great idea. So I tried it and it was so uh, hard to do that in hard, not in the sense it was difficult, but hard in the sense that if there's gonna be one conversation, the, the writer should be able to engage both, both age groups in one conversation. And then another person said, why don't you make a flip book so you go forward with one age and backward the other way. And all these ideas are really creative solutions, but I thought the best thing to do would be try to have one conversation. So in writing it, this is what the myths that came out uh, that's around the popular literature, and, and I'd like to see if you've heard them. How many of you have heard in the popular media, newspapers, or even books that the adolescent period is this really, really terrible time that you can't believe you're getting into and you hope you can just get through it okay. Have any of you heard that? And that message is so sad and it's actually so wrong. Uh, and it, when it, as an adolescent, of course, if you hear that message, it makes you feel like, oh my God, what's gonna happen or what, what's gonna happen to my peers? Um, and so we're gonna explore, in fact, how rather than being a period you have to just endure and barely get through, Adolescence is an incredible opportunity for really wonderful growth. And part of that growth is about learning about the self uh, that you can do with mindfulness practices and other things we'll talk about. Um, but part of it is just learning even about how your brain is changing, which we'll talk about soon. 
A second myth, and you can tell me if you've heard about this, is that adolescence is a time when your hormones are raging out of control. How many have heard that? <laughs> yeah, and that's actually not true. Hormones change because of puberty, so with sexual development, of course, there's a whole new set of hormones that are arising, and that is a change, for sure. But the changes in the way we think as adolescents, or we feel as adolescents, or even how we behave, is not due to what happens with our hormones. Let me just check with the sound people here. Is there anything I can do to stop this from clicking like that? Something is making a... Uh, let me stop your microphone real quick. Okay. Um, so, can you still hear me, or is it off now? You can, it's off. Okay, but you can hear me anyway? Okay, so we'll get, wait for the new mic to come. Uh, but, uh, so here's, here's the idea, that it isn't the raging hormones that make for the changes that do happen in adolescence. It's actually changes in the brain that we're going to review in great detail in just a moment. The third myth that is really striking is, and maybe you've heard it, uh, that adolescence is a period of immaturity and that we don't get mature until like even the mid-twenties. Have any of you heard that? Yeah. And actually what I'm going to suggest to you, thank you, what I'm going to suggest to you is that that's actually not only wrong, but it's a destructive way of thinking. Because then you enter the adolescent period, you say, well, I guess I must be just immature. So what would you do if the whole society was telling you you're immature? You'd be immature. Why wouldn't you? You'd have to be out of your mind not to do what people say to you, right? No. I'm just kidding about that. But you would act the way people expect you to be. And so the problem with calling it immature is, first of all, it's wrong. And secondly, it's destructive. And thirdly, the truth of it is, is that it's a necessary period of change. And when you understand the way the, thank you very much. No problem. When you understand the way the brain uh, is changing during this time, you realize it's not a period of immaturity. It's necessary for both the individual and for our whole human species in order to change. So let's review what we do know about the way the brain changes. And these studies have only been done in the last dozen years or so. And they keep on emerging. We're doing them at UCLA. They're done at the National Institute of Health. Uh, a lot of them are done in the United States. So we should just start this review by saying these are studies of American adolescents. And I say that because if we went to Papua New Guinea, where the ages of which people change are different, the age in which they take on adult responsibilities is very different, if we study their brains, you'd probably find something different. Um, someone from Europe asked me about some questions, and I've gotten this question a lot from European parents. Um, why do we send our adolescents away to college? Shouldn't they stay at home during college? Um, which is the way it's done mostly in Europe. Uh, now, it's hard to say this here at a boarding school where you've actually gone away for high school, uh, but that's what a lot of European families experience, and they think the American way is different. And if we studied European adolescent brains, it might be different. I don't know. That's never been done. So we need to say these are studies of American adolescents that have been extensively done we start studying the brains of healthy, regular kids before adolescence hits, follow them all the way into their early 20s and even late 20s. And we see that the brain does these changes that I'm going to describe for you right now. So before we talk about the changes, um, how many of you are familiar with uh, the general structure and function of the brain? Just so I can get a feeling for it. Oh, great. Okay. So you're going to be very happy, those of you familiar with it, and those of you who aren't, We'll be very happy that the Middlesex School has been so kind, along with Inward Bound Mindfulness Education, they've supplied a model of the brain that they've taped under your chair. So if you, if you reach under your chair, yeah, this is, seriously, if you reach under your chair and, and see if you can feel under that chair and, and pull out your arm and you'll see attached to your arm is a ham. And the school and IBME have invited you to take this hand home with you. It's your handout. <laughs> okay, so if, if you take your hand like this and fold your thumb in the middle and fold your fingers over the top, and my daughter says, don't ever say this, so don't tell her I said this, but it's a handy model of the brain. It, it, it's actually oriented in your head like this, okay? And this is a very useful model of the brain. You can tell her I told you that. 
Um, and we're going to review the basic parts because these basic parts are parts that are changing in adolescence, number one. And number two, when you know about it, we now know for sure that you can use your mind to strengthen the structure of your brain. And when I first started writing about that, people said, oh, you're out of your mind to say that. And that was over a dozen years ago. Now we know it's absolutely true. Mindfulness is one example uh, of using the mind to actually strengthen the way this brain functions. It's now been proven to be true. And so what I'm going to review for you is how this brain works, how we can use the mind to change it, and what happens in adolescence for the change in the brain. So let's take our hand model, put it together, orient yourself. And now this is your neuroanatomy lesson. If you feel squeamish, feel free to lie down. Um, let's lift up the top of the brain, the outer part. That's called your cortex. Let's lift up the thumb part. And let's look at the whole structure opened up like this. The first thing is your brain is up in your head. And it's sitting on top of the spinal cord, which is in your backbone, which brings all the signals, for the most part, up from the body. Uh, it goes in other ways, too. And the first of three major areas we're talking about is in your palm, in the model. Does anyone know the name of this part of the brain? It's called the brain stem. The brain stem is the oldest part of the brain. Oldest both meaning when you're in your mother's womb, it developed fully in the womb. So it's old that way. But old meaning it's about 300 million years of evolution that created this. So it's called the old reptilian brain. And we're just going to name these parts and talk about what they do in just a moment. The brain stem then is beneath the next part of the brain, which would be your thumb. And for most of us, we only have one thumb, but a perfect model would have two thumbs because uh, you'd have a left and a right. And this is called the limbic area. And this area evolved about 200 million years ago. It's halfway developed when you're born. And then when you put your fingers over the top, this is your outer bark of the brain called the cortex. And this is an area that's most advanced in mammals, so it's called the neomammalian cortex. It has different lobes. The front lobe would be from your second knuckles forward, and that's biggest in primates. And in we humans, the part that's most elaborated is the prefrontal cortex, which changes the most during adolescence, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so let me talk about what these areas do, and I'm gonna relate those to what changes in during adolescence. And for those people who are adolescents now, I want you to think about how your life was, let's say, when you were 10, how it changed when you went through puberty, and how it became when you're 14, 15, 16 years of age, and, and if you're older, then older than that. And so think about these functions and how they were. And if you're an adult who used to be an adolescent, then I want you to try to remember, if your memory still works, um, back to those days when you were an adolescent. OK? You ready? So lift up your fingers and lift up your thumb. What's this part called again? Brainstem. Excellent. So this is the part that does two really big things. It keeps you awake in class, and, or it tells you to go to sleep. So if a teacher's really good, he or she will make sure your brainstem is telling you stay awake. And it also is involved in something that's um, not so comfortable to feel, but we feel it a lot anyway in a threatened situation, we feel what's called a reactive state when we feel threatened. And that reaction can take the form of four different pathways. You can fight, you can flee, you can tighten up your muscles and freeze, or you can totally collapse and faint. So fight, flee, freeze, and faint are the four things people do when they're threatened. And this can be threatened, for example, when you're about to take an exam when you feel kind of overwhelmed or helpless, or it can be where someone literally is, is threatening you, or you're having a fight with a friend or a fight with somebody else. So the brainstem mediates that, okay? And if I shouted out no, no, no to you really harshly, you could feel that. In fact, let's just do that just for a brief experiential thing. So I'm gonna just say no a few times and just let your body respond and see what that feels like. You ready? No. 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 And now I'm going to say yes. 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 
Now take a deep breath. And let's just see, with a raising of hands, how many felt the difference between the feeling inside of you with no and with yes? Raise your hand. Okay, that's, that's just a test to see if you're awake. And uh, <laughs> shout out some words. What did no feel like? Harsh. Harsh. Tight. Tight. Tense. Tense. Retreating. Shocking. Shocking. Okay. Fear. Okay. And what did yes feel like? Gentle. Gentle. Calm. Soothing. Soothing. A smile, okay? So in the brain, we have two basic states that are created. And it's really important to experience this directly. One is a reactive state. It's like a no state, N-O, no state. And the other is a yes state, where you're receptive. And as we go through life, it's really important to monitor which state we're in. And as we interact with our friends, it's important to know what state they're in. And if you're a parent and an adolescent, you need to figure out what state each of you are in. Because if one of you is in a reactive state, it's not gonna to be too rewarding a communication happening. And to learn a technique to bring yourself from the no reactive state to a yes receptive state is essential. And actually that's what mindfulness practice allows you to do. If any of you are still feeling up tense from the no, just, just do one more exercise. Put one hand on your chest and one hand on your abdomen and put a little pressure there and you can close your eyes if you want and just feel how that feels. And now reverse it so the hand on top is on the bottom, the hand on the bottom is on the top. See how that feels. And now move it to whichever way is most comfortable for you. Okay, and let's just do a quick show of hands. How many of you felt one of those ways actually felt pretty good, pretty calming? Raise your hand. Okay, take a look. Raise your hand really high so everyone can see. Excellent. And let's just do a quick survey. How many felt right on top felt really better than left on top? And how many were the other way? Left? Isn't that interesting? Okay. Now, for any of you adolescents who are thinking of going to college, and any of you who think of going to college and want to do a study, no one has figured out why it's always the case. It's about a quarter of the population are left on top people, and three quarters are right on top people. And it doesn't have to do with left right handedness. So if you can figure that out, you can get a PhD. Um, <laughs> you'll be all set to go. No one has figured it out, but it, it's always true. And, and some people are both up and down, and some people, neither one helps them. Uh, but the vast majority, over 90% of people, and I've asked thousands of people now that, I just wanted to see if it's confirmed. Every time it's the same way. So you, anyway, but this is a good technique to do too. So this is a very calming technique. I've done physiological measures on myself and other people who do this in the way that works. And you can show their whole physiology calms down. They've taken themselves from a reactive state to receptive state just with that movement. So just learning that is really, really helpful. It's a quick tool to know that you not only can monitor what's going on inside of you, but you can modulate it. You're not helpless to just say, oh my God, I'm reactive, I'm reactive. You can learn a technique like that or like focusing on your breath that brings you to a receptive state. Okay, so that has to do literally with the brain stem working with other areas of the, of the brain to tell you whether you're being threatened or not. And it's a deep process in the brain. So if you're in a reactive state, you need to realize that. And even if you say to the person you're interacting with, hey, I need to take a break, that's better than trying to push forward in a communication when you're reactive. Because reactive communication gets us nowhere. Very, very important to know about. Okay. Now the limbic area is partially developed, this is your thumb area, so put that on over. Your limbic area is partially developed when you're born, and this is gonna be shaped a lot by experience, especially experiences with your attachment figures. And I was just at a, 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 um, a Harvard um, conference where we were talking all about this issue of how our relationships with our parents shape the way the limbic area develops. And what does the limbic area do? It's very important for working with the areas below it on creating emotion, creating motivation. So what do we feel and what are we driven to do? And it's also important for what's called appraisal, meaning it evaluates whether something is important or not and whether that important thing is good or bad. So a teacher in a classroom, for example, needs to get connected with the student's limbic areas so the student feels this is important, I think I will pay attention to what my teacher is saying. Right, that would be a useful thing. Or what my friends are saying. 
These are all ways the limbic area is evaluating the significance of something. There are two other things, memory and, and attachment relationships. Attachment basically is the kind of relationship we have with close others. So when you're one year of age, who are you attached to? Who? Your mother or your father or other caregivers. In fact, we evolved to have many caregivers, not just one. So we can have many attachment figures, not a dozens of them, but we can have more than one. And those caregivers, those attachment figures are very important. So when we're upset, we want to be seen so we can be soothed and feel safe so we feel secure. Those are the four S's of attachment. You're seen, meaning your inner mental life of feelings and thoughts are seen by your caregiver. So that makes you feel not alone in the world. You're kept safe, so you're protected from harm. You feel soothed, so when you're distressed, communicating with your caregiver helps you calm down. And then you overall feel secure when you're in a relationship with that person. So it's pretty cool. And we as mammals invented this thing called attachment. And when you're a little kid, you're attached to your parents. And then interestingly, when you enter adolescence, this is the first big change we're going to talk about. The limbic area basically starts to change once you go through puberty. And instead of having dependence just on your parents, who else do you find you want to get connected to when you're upset? Your friends, your peers. And this is a big difference. Now you can say, well, that's, that's really sad if you're a parent. I want my little baby at home, right? And I know I had to go through that when my kids started pushing away and I'd say, what's wrong with her, that 13 year old? She wants to be with her friends, not her dad. And I would, I would say to her, let's go to the movies, like when she was nine. And she said, she'd look at me and roll her eyes. She goes, I don't think so, you know? <laughs> but that's good. Her limbic area was developing. Now, why would you have a period of time when the limbic area, which was so attached to your mom or dad, would say, hey, I'm gonna get with my peers now more. Why would this be not a sign of immaturity, but a sign of a change that is necessary? It's nature's way to get you ready to move out. Yes. Did, would you want to add something to you? No, not survival. And survival, right. It, you know, we, you actually need, and there's a long biological reason for this, but you need offspring to leave the nest. Now, if you think about it, when you're like two years of age, three years of age, you know, eight years of age, think about this. You wake up, someone makes you breakfast, right? You go to school, you play, you do whatever, you come home, they make you dinner. They tuck you in at night. Why would anyone in their right mind leave that situation? <laughs> like now that I'm saying it, I want to go back, mom, where are you? If you think about it, who in their right mind would leave that? Well, You've got to change your mind by changing your brain. This is the thing. So the first change we're talking about is the limbic area is getting ready to become more active and push away from parents being the attachment figures only. Doesn't mean you have to isolate yourself, but you get ready to push away from only being with your parents. Okay, so that's the first thing that happens. The limbic area is also then communicating if you put your cortex down with the cortex and the cortex is what we use to map out all sorts of things. Like when I move my hands like this, the way you see them is the back of your cortex is making maps of what's going on. The front of the cortex, uh, well, the side is for mapping out sound. The upper side is for mapping out your body and where it stops and starts. And the front part is for thinking. And the frontmost part is for doing all sorts of things which I call mind sight maps. Mind sight is the ability to see the mind of yourself or others. So part of this area makes a mind sight map of you, that is of myself, let's say, I'll do it from my point of view. So I have a mind sight map of me, and the mind sight map of me says what's going on in my body right now, what's going on in my emotions, what's happening in my memory, what's happening right now in this present moment, what happened before, and what would I like to happen in the future. So it does what's called mental time travel. It's awesome, and we know exactly what areas of the brain do that. So if I'm gonna really have self-awareness, I have to have a combination of mindfulness of the present moment, but also I have to be open to what's happened in the past and know where I've been, and I have to be open to creating a future I want to make. This is a big change in how an eight-year-old thinks when you start developing these mind sight maps. And one of the biggest changes in the way we think it when we become teenagers is that we start thinking about ourselves in a totally different context. Now, those of you who are adolescents now, let me ask you, when you think about how you think about yourself now, 
Do you notice it's different than how you thought about yourself when you were eight? What do you think? And any one of you. <laughs> no pressure. Up. It's an invitation. What's that? You think of yourself critically. You mean like, like critically meaning thinking of yourself with harsh words? With harsh words. Okay. So that would be a good example of how like a part of you is being like pressuring yourself. But you, maybe you weren't doing it when you were eight. So that would be a good reason to actually do mindfulness practice, because in mindfulness practice, it teaches you to take that harsh critic that's judging you. And one way of defining mindfulness actually is being aware of the present moment and letting go of judgments and becoming more compassionate toward yourself. So that would be a great example, because that is what a lot of teenagers feel, especially when you feel all the pressure, like go to school and get good grades and all that stuff, and so do it this way, right? So mindfulness practice would be great to deal with that. How about any of the other adolescents? Any other ways you notice you're thinking differently now than when you're eight? OK, any adults who once were at, oh, did you have something? OK, when you're eight, you thought about friends, and now you're thinking about work. And what kind of work are you thinking about? Say it again. So anything you have, like all the things that are on your to-do list? Yeah, so okay. So now you're, you're, this prefrontal cortex is now not just thinking about friends, it's actually planning out what's coming next. What do I have to do, what do I have to do? And actually mindfulness is helpful for that too because you can actually have your plan and instead of having anxiety and pressure about it, it just lets you see the plan without having it loaded up with anxiety. So that would be a good example of how the adolescent brain changes because you start to think about the future and what you have to do in very different ways because this prefrontal cortex is developing now. So as these changes are happening, and they're going to keep on changing to the mid-20s, um, so we say the adolescent period actually goes from around 12 to around 24, more or less, so like the second dozen years of life. It doesn't end when the teenage years end. And what we know then is that this is not a period of immaturity, but let's review what it's actually a period all about. The brain is changing in a way that gets the adolescent to push back on the adults that raised her or him. And adults experiencing this think, oh my God, this is rebellion, this is immaturity. But actually, it's necessary for both the individual to get ready to leave the nest, which is absolutely crucial, and it's also necessary for our species to go out in the world and not just keep on doing things the way the adult generation has done things. So this pushback, pushback is absolutely a healthy part of adolescent development, whereas adults sometimes look and go, oh, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Now, what do you need to actually do that is you need a change in the way the brain is weighing the pros and cons of things. Because if it just stays like an eight-year-old brain, it says, look, I'm familiar with my home, I like getting tucked in at night. I like someone making me dinner. I like someone making me breakfast. I don't actually want to think about all the things I need to do. And I just want to kind of be here with my mom and dad. I mean, if, if that's what I have and it's good, that's fine. So you need the brain to change. And how is it going to change? It's got to change in two fundamental ways. It's got to have a change in what feels rewarding. And it's got to change in the way it weighs pros and cons. And that's exactly what happens in the brain. There's a system in the brain called the dopamine system, which is also called the reward circuitry. And once you go from being 8, let's say, to 14, the dopamine system changes in a very profound way where dopamine gives you a feeling of satisfaction. Like, I've done this work, and now I feel like I've completed it. Or I've done this sport, and I've worked out, and I feel like I've completed it and then you get a dopamine squirt, and that's great. But the dopamine levels in adolescence, the baseline levels drop, which means that you are no longer content just doing what you're doing because there's a feeling like I gotta be doing something. And that's why some adolescents feel boredom if they're not engaged in doing something, much more than they did when they were eight. So that's one change. The second change in dopamine is that the release levels are much higher. Now what that means is that when you do something you're, you're passionate about doing, 
the dopamine release is much higher and you feel a deeper sense of reward. Now this change in the reward system is crucial because one of the most important kinds of experiences that release dopamine are doing new things, novelty. Doing new things actually secretes dopamine. Now the upside of that, and there's always upsides and downsides to each of these changes, the upside is that you be driven to do new things, which is kind of cool. But the downside is what? What's the downside about doing something new? It's dangerous. When you go out away from the nest, it is dangerous, right? So the brain's got to do one more thing to deal with that danger. It has to do something else. And what it does is it changes the way the limbic area and the cortex work together to evaluate the pros and cons. And the formal research term, and you can tell me whether this is a term you feel comfortable with, but it's a term in the science. It's called hyper-rational thinking. And the hyper-rational thinking means that, let's say, um, you're going to go, you get into a car and you're 16, and you say, I'd like to drive this car 100 miles an hour. And it's 2 in the morning, so the chances of someone being on this street at 2 in the morning are so low that I'm going to do it. Because how exciting would that be to go 100 miles an hour in my mom's car? <laughs> right? So the rational part of it, it's true. At 2 in the morning, there's probably no one out on the street. It's, the probability, rationally, is that it's like that. But let's say there's a 10% chance that someone is on the street. And you're going 100 miles an hour. What might happen? You might kill them. Like what happened to my favorite teacher in my psychiatry training. He was killed by a 19-year-old going 95 miles an hour on a local street. Right? And I always wondered, like, what was that 19-year-old thinking? Until I found this set of research studies that show that adolescents absolutely, on a whole, know the dangers. Informing them about the dangers doesn't change anything. They know about the dangers. It's their limbic area and their cortical region basically have this hyper-rational thinking where they're just weighing the pros much higher. 100 miles an hour, how exciting could that be? Uh, there's a 10% chance that someone could be on the road and I would hit them. But, but my God, that, that's so exciting and a 90% chance that nothing will happen. And so they engage in the behavior. So what is the myth is that dangerous behaviors in adolescence are due to impulsivity. This is not impulsive behavior. It's actually not, because impulsive behavior, you say, okay, just think about it, or here, know about the risk. So this is where you say, well, what can we do? And here's something that is completely not intuitive to understand, because the brain, just to review it, this adolescent brain is going to be more emotional. The limbic area is going to bring more emotions up into the cortex. And it's going to be more socially engaged, so the adolescent will be more influenced by what happens with peers, for sure. Novelty is going to be there, and so there's a drive to do new things. And these things explain risky behavior. But then what can we do as adolescents to try to prevent that? And what can we do from, from harm happening? Or what can we do as adults? Because sadly, and I don't want to scare anybody, but for those of you who are adolescents and those of you who are adults taking care of adolescents, let's just say what the research shows. The healthiest time of life when your body can fight diseases better than any other time is during adolescence, between 12 and 24. Healthiest time of life. The most dangerous time of life of preventable accidents that lead to serious harm and death is adolescence. From accidents to suicide to murder, as we know, sadly, in this country, with all the shootings that are going on, these are adolescents that are involved in these things, often adolescent males, but adolescents. So what's going on here? Right? These are huge, important questions that literally are a matter of life and death. So the concern for those of your adolescents that your parents have when they say, you know, wear a helmet when you ride a bike, or if you go to a party and you get drunk, call me, don't, I don't want you driving, or driving when someone's drunk, they're not just out of their minds, they're actually accurate about the danger. So what do we do to help with the danger and decrease it? Here's what's counterintuitive. When you get an adolescent in touch with what their body is telling them is good, 
not their emotions that just say, oh, it's going to be exciting, exciting, exciting. But I mean, literally, we now know around your intestines, literally around your gut, you have neural networks that are like a gut brain. And around your heart, you literally have neural networks that are a heart brain. And mindfulness as a practice gives you access literally to what your body signals are telling you up in your brain, in your head. And what we know is, is that the values that people have, like, for example, if you said to that person who sadly killed my professor, if someone had taught him to be mindfully aware so that when he got into that sports car his parents bought him, and instead of going, oh yeah, the chances are so minimal, although he did this at 5 p.m. on a Friday afternoon when you couldn't imagine more traffic there, but in any event, you know, whatever his equation was, if he could have said, you know, in my gut, in my heart, the idea of running someone over and killing them feels so not right intuitively, even though my emotions are telling me this would be so exciting, so exciting, and my appraisal centers, not that anyone thinks like that, but my appraisal centers are saying, oh, this is so exciting, I should do that. His gut and his heart would tell him not to. Because adults telling someone not to do something doesn't get them not to do it. You know, it's like, do you know uh, what, you know about smoking and how it causes harm to your body, right? Does everyone know about that? So, um, the, the adolescence is not only a time of danger for risky behaviors that lead to harm to self and others, but it's actually a time of most risk for getting addicted to cigarettes or to alcohol or to other drugs. Um, because of this dopamine change, that's, dopamine is the reason we get addicted to drugs. Because any drug of addiction, you actually secrete dopamine and then you get in the cycle of needing it, needing it, needing it. So adolescence is a very vulnerable period. By the way, it's also the primary time of life when if there's gonna be a psychiatric disorder like depression or manic depressive illness or schizophrenia or any of these other serious illnesses, and I was just at a conference on a different kind of disorder, personality disorder, they emerge during adolescence. So this is a very vulnerable time too because there are a lot of changes in the brain that we'll talk about in just a moment. But here's the issue is that when you get a person in touch with their positive values, let's say in smoking, how can you get them to stop? Well, the first thing they thought about is let's just inform adolescents about how dangerous it is to smoke. Now, based on what I just said, now do we know that most adolescents are aware of dangers? Yeah, they are. They have that knowledge, right? So informing them actually isn't going to do it. So then they decided they would scare them, right? The adults put together these ads that showed these x-rays of horribly diseased lungs and said, look what's going to happen to you. Now, these were adults then showing adolescents pictures of diseased lungs. And how do you think that affected the kids smoking? Not at all. So what would you do, based on everything you've heard about adolescents pushing adults away and wanting to be in touch with their own values of what's important, what do you think they did that actually worked? This is like this brilliant move. You could do peers doing it. I guess that would be great. That would have been good. They didn't do that, but that would be great. Have peers say, hey, that's not cool to do that. They didn't do that. Here's what they decided to do. They said, hey, um, did you know that the adults who own the cigarette companies realize that you are going to get addicted to this stuff and they're going to take your money from you and get really rich? because you're vulnerable to them just you, making you addicted to this stuff. And the kids stop smoking. Why would they let an adult treat them like that, right? So it was a perfect ad to say, look, this is what's happening. The adults really want you to do this. They said, I'm not doing it, you know? <laughs> it was so smart. I mean, that's clever. That's clever. So let's just review in brief the essence of adolescence and let's first highlight exactly what's happening in the brain. If you had to come away from this talk and say, what's actually happening in the brain? The word is remodeling. Between 12 and 24, the brain is remodeling itself. It goes from basically you're born into the world and the brain is ready to learn from your parents and then from other adults. And so before around, let's say, 11 years of age, the brain is like a sponge. It just soaks in the knowledge of our culture. We learn, we learn, we learn, we soak it in. Cool, that's great. 
And then something huge happens around 11, 12 years of age. Huge. There are changes in the way genes are being expressed, changes in the way the brain is going to grow, and two big things are, are what's happening in remodeling. One, it sounds a little scary, but you just need to know about it, is called pruning. Genetically, the brain, the brain is designed to start cutting away the existing neurons that were there, and the ones that will remain are the ones that are going to be used. So if you're an adolescent and you like music, keep on playing music. If you like sports, keep on doing sports. Whatever you like doing, keep on doing, because the brain is going to start specializing, and if you're not using it, you're going to lose it. And this becomes a really important issue for any adolescent to know about, that find what you're passionate about and really keep that going in your life. It's also why schools should teach foreign languages before adolescence hits. So kids really start soaking that in and keep that going. Okay, so that's one thing, is that you're going to have pruning. The next thing you're going to have is called myelination, which is where you're laying down this really healthy sheath among connected neurons. It allows things to work 3,000 times in a more coordinated and speedy way. And so overall, when you allow the pruning to happen, you're specializing the areas. And then when you connect them with myelin, you're actually linking them. And the term we use for linking differentiated areas is called integration. So the beautiful thing about everything happening in your brains as adolescents is that your brain is becoming more and more integrated. The more integrated it is, the stronger it is, the more efficient it is, the more coordinated it is, the more resilient you are. So in the Brainstorm book, what I do is I put exercises that have been proven to increase integration in your brain. And it teaches you as an adolescent who's doing the book or as an adult who wants to catch up uh, for what they maybe didn't get, um, it, teaches them, it teaches the reader how to integrate your brain. Because the fabulous news is you can actually keep your brain developing at any age. It's great during adolescence to take advantage of the changes that are going on remodeling, but even as adults, we can use our minds to change our brain. So let me review with you then what we've covered in terms of the essence of adolescence that makes it, for me anyway, memorable. And as Jessica said, I love acronyms. And so this is the one acronym you're going to get tonight, which is the word essence. E-S-S-E-N-C-E. -S -E -E. Fortunately, we've covered everything, so this is a review. The first thing, E-S, take your, your brain model out. And this, by the way, you do get to take this home, so that's fine. Um, what we said is that research shows that the limbic area and brain stem and body are going to be producing more signals that influence the reasoning of the cortex. Those signals are the source of emotion. So ES emotional spark. The first of our essence is emotional spark. We are more filled with passion during the adolescent years. Um, and the sad thing is, as adults, sometimes we lose that passion. And so this is the first element of the essence, emotional spark, that we need to think about as adults. Maybe we need to try to re ignite in our lives. So the emotional spark is absolutely how the brain changes. And the drive of that, of course, is it gets you to get ready to leave the nest. Very, very important. The downside is what? Emotions can be really confusing sometimes and look like they're too stormy and a different kind of brainstorm and you're all over the place. So for sure there's a downside to it, but to use mindfulness practices and the larger term I use is time in where you go inward and develop your ability to see the mind, which I call mind sight. These mind sight skills, one of which is mindfulness, uh, allow you actually to balance your emotions more. And it's why learning mindfulness during the adolescent years is so important. So that's the first thing, emotional spark. S-E, anyone, can anyone guess what that is? Social environment. As we said, the adolescent period is a time to connect with your peers. It's absolutely necessary for your own development. Why would that be the case? Well, that's right. You cannot survive alone. We don't have big fangs. We don't have big claws. We are incredibly social species. So as you get ready to leave the nest, here's the issue. Having membership with your peer group for most adolescents is literally a matter of life and death. It's not that you just want to keep up with peer pressure or keep up with the, your, the fad of the day of what your peers are doing. It's literally 
a millions of years of evolution that have been getting you ready for this moment to leave the nest. And you do that by being in numbers. We don't survive. I was just in Africa and teaching there and I took some time off and went on the savanna. And, and I'm telling you, the way we as mammals survive is by being together with other members of our species. And if you're alone, basically, your brainstem is gonna tell you, no, 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 no. You're gonna be in a state of reactivity. And that's why, for parents, just know this, when your teen says, I really need to do this, I need to do this with my friends, their friends literally are a matter of life and death for them. That's just a feeling. It's not just they're being superficial. It's a deep brainstem limbic feeling that is created. And so this social engagement is really important. Now, the downside, of course, is that you may cave into peer pressure, but the upside is that what do we know is the best predictor of health in your relationships, I'm sorry, health in your life throughout the lifespan? Every study show supportive relationships are the number one predictor of your medical health, your mental health, and even how long you live. And sadly, some adults forget about that and don't cultivate and maintain their friendships. So social engagement, really important. Okay, what do you think the N is of essence? What do we say allows the adolescent to leave the nest and push out to try new things? Novelty. So novelty, seeking novelty, is literally hardwired into this changing brain. Now, of course, adults look at that and say, oh, immature or rebellious, just the opposite. Just the opposite. Trying to push away from adults and do new things, bless you, is actually the core of well-being. Right, so we as adults have to, have to address that. Now, the, the downside we've said are the risk-taking behaviors. That's not so good, and in fact, it's a real danger. It's super real danger. So we need to really balance this out by getting kids in touch with their intuition, getting adolescents in touch with their intuition. And we as adults need to be in touch with our intuition too, but we need to embrace novelty even in adulthood. One of the best predictors of your brain growing throughout adulthood is how you try new things not just keep on doing the familiar. And yet a lot of us as adults, what we do, and don't, you know, don't worry about this adolescence, you don't have to do it that way, but as adults, what happens to us? You tell me. You get into the familiar, same old, same old, same old, and pretty soon your brain carves out the same circuitry, does the same thing over and over again, and instead of things looking fresh and new and exciting, instead of you feeling really deeply grateful for how amazing it is that we're even alive, Right? Or, and if you practice mindfulness, you can have the experience where literally the ordinary becomes extraordinary. You know, I have a dear friend who died recently. Uh, we were exactly the same age. And, you know, it was just out of nowhere. And just reminds you of how precious this life is. And the moments that sometimes can be so difficult, like if your adolescent is doing something new and you don't know what's going on, take a deep breath and really reflect inwardly. And get a, you can get a perspective on how... Novelty is actually a great thing, not only in adolescence, but throughout our lifespan. Then there's the last part of essence. We have emotional spark, we have social engagement, novelty seeking, and the CE is creative explorations. You know, when middle schools and high schools ask me to come consult to them using this kind of brainstorm set of ideas, and they say, how should we organize our curriculum? And we have one whole province in Canada that's thinking about reorganizing it. What I say is this, I say, if you look at the emotional spark adolescents have, the passion that they have, that a lot of adults have lost, if you look at the social engagement, they have to collaborate with each other rather than compete with each other, the novelty that they seek out, and the creative explorations that in various ways, they're gonna try to put new combinations together, where you probably realize this, that in science, in art, in music, and in, of course, our technology, with our digital world, those advances, primarily made by adolescents. Primarily by adolescents. In small ways and big ways, adolescents approach the world and say, you know something, the old world was like this, I don't need to do it that way. And that's why our species as a whole have adapted to every aspect of this planet. 
we've gone out and done things. So what I say when these schools ask me to consult is I say, look, here's what I need to ask you. And I don't know if this is true at Middlesex School, but I, in general in schools, when they ask me, I say, tell me what it's like in middle school. They go, our kids are so disengaged. They don't care. They're bored. We don't know how to really get them interested in what's going on. I said, how about high school? They said, just the same. They're just pressured, so much homework. They can't deal with the pressure, and they worry, and they think that which college you go to really makes a big difference, and they're so pressured. And I go, well, yeah, this is an uncertain world. You want to grab onto something that's certain, like a score or something like that. I said, but what would happen if you actually took this essence of adolescence and organized an entire curriculum around it? What would that look like? And I go, what do you mean? I said, well, if you take the passion that's built into the adolescent brain to have these subcortical areas pushing emotion forward, the emotional spark, and you take the social engagement and get adolescents to actually work with each other rather than against each other, if you get them to collaborate rather than just compete, and demolish each other, and, you know? And, and the novelty, what if instead of saying, here's what the curriculum is, this is what we as adults have decided you must learn, and here's the test, and there's a right and wrong, what if you take a new approach to that and let them use their drive for creative exploration and say, look, here's what we're doing. You're in sixth grade, you're in seventh grade, you're an adolescent now, we know how your brain is changing, we're going to honor that. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to assemble yourselves in groups, and you're going to pick one of these seven huge world problems, right? Climate change issues, famine, you know, with people not having enough to eat, uh, you know, pollution, war, uh, violence, all the things you can, you can imagine. You set them up. You say, so we as adults have created a world that you're about to inherit that's not so good. We've kind of screwed up. And we can't figure out how to get out of this mess. So here's your job. You're going to use whichever of these eight areas you're passionate about, assemble in groups. You're going to engage with each other, the social engagement. You're going to look for new ways to approach things because we've got to fail. And you're going to find new creative solutions. And you know something? Not only would they learn to use the teacher as a consultant to help them find information and get experts in and all that kind of stuff, but I would bet you the kind of solutions that adolescents would come up with might just turn the tide and make this a better place to live. That's how deeply we need to respect the courage and creativity and collaboration of adolescents. So rather than all those myths, you know, that they're immature and they're crazy and they're, they, they, can't, they can't focus or all these things that you just have to barely get through it, we gotta, we gotta change the cultural conversation and actually tap into this unbelievably creative group of individuals, support them in being exactly who they are and reaching their full potential. And the, it's a win-win-win situation because when adults realize that they too can reignite their emotional spark, get more socially engaged, have more novelty in their life and actually put creativity in their life, they're going to make their brains healthier, their own brains. They're going to have better communication with their adolescents. Adolescents are going to benefit because they're going to actually be able to tap into their fullest potential with the techniques of mindfulness practice and other ways of knowing about your body, these mindset skills, for example, that you learn in the book. This is an opportunity for us to change how we approach this whole period of time. And when we promote more integration in our lives as adults going through this process and also as adolescents, the result of integration is resilience and kindness and compassion. So all the ways we often live with harshness and a feeling of pressure, the studies are very clear. When you do these practices, when you actually take this approach, you can approach things rather than withdraw from them. You can calm your anxiety. You can release your harsh critic inside of yourself. You can collaborate more. You feel more connected. You keep your brain young. I can list all the ways your immune system is better, your caps on your chromosomes will be improved. There's all these things. A study just came out that if you do these things, this was in the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences, a study came out, if you take a life of compassion and connection and equanimity, which all these things we've been talking about can create, there's actually a gene, a set of genes on your chromosomes that will be turned on that will prevent diseases. And I'm not exaggerating that. That was just published in one of the most prestigious scientific journals. What you do with your mind changes 
every aspect of your life, including the way genes will help prevent disease. It will actually increase the enzyme called telomerase. And Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize for discovering this whole system. When you do these mindfulness practices, you will increase the enzyme telomerase that maintains and repairs these things called telomeres, which are the caps on chromosomes that allow your cells when they divide to maintain their integrity. When you do these practices, you'll increase your immune system's function so that you'll be able to fight infections better. When you do these functions, you can actually take the integrative fibers of the brain, the ones that we want to grow during adolescence and we want to maintain in adulthood, and you will grow them more. I'm not making any of this stuff. It's all in published. The most prestigious scientific journals around are publishing these carefully done studies. So that's the invitation. Bust these myths that have totally been distorting what the adolescent period is, of life is like. So for the individual and for individual families, it's going to lead to more collaboration and deeper understanding and more compassion across the generations. But for our larger world, think about it. Imagine the creative, collaborative intelligence that can be released if we make this happen. Now, no single book can do this, but an entire cultural shift can happen. It's called cultural evolution. And I don't want to put the pressure on the adolescents in the room or the adults in the room, but I want to just invite you to think about this. Change only happens when individuals working together in collaborative groups bring the intention to bring a positive change into the world. And this is really something you can do. This is something we all can do. And I invite you to participate in how we can really bring a more creative and compassionate approach to adolescence, to our adulthood, to our life together on this home we call Earth. Thank you so much for your attention and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So welcome to the journey. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to see if we can do this. You know, it's a busy world out there. There's a lot of stuff happening. And when we take this inside out approach, the potential is huge to make a positive difference. So we have time now for questions, right, and discussion. So I'm happy to take those. I don't know if we have a microphone to go out in the audience or how, or I can just repeat the question. Um, there was a mic. Do you, it used to be here. Let's see. I don't see it. Yes, I'll repeat your question while we're waiting for a mic. Okay. Um, I, when I was in college, I taught in something called upward bound. So, so when you were in college, you taught in something called upward bound? Yeah. Upward bound. Okay, in, in, in preparing for change, yes. Good. Have, have, I, I, have I personally been involved? I run the Mindful Awareness Research Center, which actually has a connection with inward bound mindfulness education. And so we actually have a training program uh, that we, we, we do. Uh, we have people fly into UCLA and we actually do train people to go out and be mindfulness facilitators. So if you're interested in that program, it's the, the, the website is marc.ucla.edu. And I don't know if IBME is doing any of that, uh, that training, but we're affiliated with IBME and so you can check out what we do. Um, and, you know, law school is a really important place to do this. Medical school is a really important place to do this. You know, we need to spread this all around. And, and thank you for the work you're doing. Yeah, so, but check out the Mark uh, website and you can see what we do. We do both research and we do uh, uh, trainings. We, we kind of, we balance both. Yes? Yes, can everyone hear? Yes. Uh, the question basically is, is uh, there is a web page called Lumosity.com. Yes, Lumosity.com, yes. Do you have any feelings whether that's Yes, well, you know, um, Lumosity.com is done by a bunch of Stanford neuroscientists and others. 
Um, and I haven't seen the research to back it up, but uh, colleagues I have who do it enjoy it and they find it's useful. Just up the bay from Stanford, up at UC San Francisco, there's another program which does have research that's clearly available, but it's not as um, you know, um, well developed. And that's called positscience.com. Uh, and, and that was the original uh, you know, online keep your brain stimulated program. Um, and, I, and I do know about Michael, uh, Mike Mraznik, who actually runs that, is a, like a top-notch person. I just don't know the science behind Lumosity to say. My friends who do it really enjoy it, and that's beautiful, but I, I haven't seen the research. But it's certainly out there all, all the time, and it might be fantastic. I just don't know what the science is behind it. But, but if you're interested in, in, in one that's absolutely validated, look at Posit Science, P-O-S-I-T, and then science.com or dot something. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, you're referring to the, the suicides that have happened. Um, does everyone know about that? Oh, the murder. Oh, the teacher, I'm sorry, because there's also two suicides, right? that happened. Oh, maybe you didn't know about that. Um, so let's talk about both. Um, yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, there's so much to say about it. First of all, uh, my condolences for, for the family and for the, the teacher who was killed. Um, and, you know, the small part that I looked at was that the people who knew the, the young the adolescent, I guess he was 14, 14, who has been arrested, um, said that they didn't detect anything in him that would make them worry, which of course makes us all worry. Um, and uh, so I would like to know more about that. Um, you know, when you look at the essence of adolescence, the emotional spark, the social engagement, the novelty seeking, the creative exploration, nothing in that is about murdering somebody. So because the adolescent period is a time when you get the onset of psychiatric disturbances uh, of all sorts, probably because of this pruning that goes on where a vulnerable individual for either genetic reasons or experiential reasons from family life or genes or a combination of the two, um, you know, has the adolescent pruning going around with stress, that pruning can become worse. Um, you can get the release of regulating behavior and the release of anger and all sorts of things that can explain, unfortunately, stuff like that that can happen with a psychiatric disturbance. I mean, just take, for example, John Lennon. When John Lennon was murdered, it was from someone who had a psychiatric disturbance. So there are times, sadly, in our world where there are guns available that, although actually that wasn't even the gun, was it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, sadly, we live with these horrible, horrible things that happen, you know, and I don't know if, if the school is going to examine its own community and see if there was anything that could be done. Sadly, sometimes there's nothing that can be done to prevent something like that. I mean, I'll just say that. So we need to see how it all unfolds. Just to give you a, a comparative example, um, a, a dear friend of mine had a situation where a relative was in a school where the person had um, a psychiatric meltdown in college in a dorm. And instead of the dorm um, realizing this person was in trouble and there they could have detected it, they just isolated this person, isolated him. This is an adolescent, you know, 19, isolated and isolated him. And then ultimately a terrible tragedy happened that could have been prevented if the community had taken responsibility uh, for the members of the community. That's not always the case. There are sometimes people that are not even being bullied, there's nothing happening, and there's just disturbances, sadly, in the mind, and these terrible things can happen. So, you know, in terms of what you can do as a school, the community needs to get together and people need to talk about the feelings about what happened, of course, and be open about that and how scary it is and how vulnerable people feel. And um, I watched, a, uh, I think it was the Today Show or something, where they had three of her um, high school friends uh, who are talking about her life and you know, finding a way to really make sure everyone talks about their feelings is the most important thing. Because now, basically, your, your school community, the whole world, but the people who are close to this teacher, you know, will be in a state of grief. 
And grief is not a, 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 it's not a problem to be solved, it's an emotion to be experienced. Um, and that's really an important way to recognize it so that people don't have to feel ashamed of the terrible feelings of helplessness, you know, thinking I should, have prote I should have protected her, I should have known, I was with him in my class, why didn't I know he was gonna murder her? You know, these are things that sometimes cannot be known. Um, and, and letting people release the guilt they may feel and, and, the, the, and, and having the school reflect on that. And that's totally different if, if we were to hear, and I don't know about it, you can tell us, if the school said, well, this kid was being bullied and no one was doing anything about it, and he was screaming out of control and said he was kill people and everyone ignored it, that's like a completely different thing. And that does happen, like with my friend's child. Um, but, uh, you know, if it hasn't happened, we just need to know that's a part of, sadly, being human, is that there can be very disturbed people and you, you don't see it. Um, does that help at all? Yeah. Talking about it is, the, for those kids, especially close to that boy, that, to talking about it, the whole school talking about it, and just letting it be named. You know, I have this phrase, you know, name it to tame it. You know, you name it grief. You talk about vulnerability. You talk about helplessness. And, and, and you know, like anything in life, you know, obviously if we could prevent it, that, that's the best thing. Sometimes you can't prevent things, so then when things are as they are, the, the, the mindful approach, if you will, the way to really be with it is to see some of these crises, you don't want to make them happen. When they've happened, you actually can find the opportunity to deepen a learning for all those kids and make them aware of their emotional state, to teach them how to support each other, to acknowledge when grief has happened, um, and you know, to do something perhaps in her name, to honor her you know, if they feel there's something that will be helpful for her family and for the school. Uh, things like that can be very helpful, but not to be quiet about it and to own the painful parts. And if it has to be in a private counseling session for those kids to say, I should have known on the soccer thing, he said he was mad at me for kicking the ball at his shin and I should have known that meant he was gonna kill his teacher. I mean, even if that doesn't make sense, someone may be feeling that. And listen, here's the thing. Um, like for example, for me, when John Lennon was killed, even though I was 3,000 miles away, um, I kept on going over and over and over my head, why didn't Lennon do this? Why didn't Lennon do that? Why did, why did he have to stop outside of his house? Why couldn't he drive into the house and get a sandwich? Why did he say, it's okay, I'll get out of the car, and then the guy shot him? You know, so we, when we feel helpless, we go over and over and over and over and over, and our, our cortex does this, and feeling of helplessness. And so that's just something to name. And it's a part of, sadly, growing up in the world is, is, is being open to that feeling. And, and still being able to have joy in life and moving forward through your grief, but realizing, you know, this is just what it means to be human, and it's what an adolescent can struggle with. It would be much harder for a younger person to uh, embrace that, but I, I, it's important to have that conversation. Yes, thank you. And I did bring up the suicide. I hope that wasn't new for those of you who've heard of it. It's all of the news. You know, and that's just another sad thing. You know, a lot of people will feel why didn't I know? Why couldn't I have prevented it? And a community is gathering around talking about this. And, uh, it, it, very important not to, as you know, not to uh, make a hero out of the person who died because sadly there's this thing called contagion. You all know about that, right? Where you, know, you make a hero out of a suicide completer and other people commit suicide because they look at that hero status and they feel, well, I, I feel so empty right now. I'd rather be a hero and be dead than be empty and be alive and then other people kill themselves. So we've learned a lot about not, not making those people into heroes uh, just for the sake of the living. Um, and so talking about, talking about feelings of despair, suicide is a very serious risk during adolescence in general and finding a way to get people just in touch with what that feeling is like of helplessness. And, and it isn't even depression so much as what my teacher who started the American Suicide Prevention Service, Ed Schneidman, would call psych ache. You ache so much and you feel no relief, you feel so helpless that you think suicide is actually going to solve that problem, uh, not even realizing how much pain it would cause everyone in its wake, uh, but you just feel so much pain. So 
having people realize they can get relief from that pain is the crucial thing to do. Yes. Can everybody hear? Okay, so I'm going to repeat. If you say a little bit, I'll repeat it. We don't have a microphone. Is that, did it go away? If you stood up, that would be better, too. Yes, and face this wonderful group. Yeah, well, preschool is a little late. They should have started when their kid was two. <laughs> yeah. Well, for what? Yeah, exactly. Well, let me, let me address that. First of all, the idea of culture, um, culture is basically just relationships and the communication we have and the ideas we spread around. So when we talk, for example, about making these ideas a part of cultural evolution, it's absolutely the way we've been evolving as human beings is by cultural evolution, not so much by genetic evolution in the last definitely few hundred years, but even thousands of years. So this is a really important issue. Um, uh, how many of you who are adolescents right now in the room feel pressure academically on what's going on with you? Raise your hand. Let's see. So you can, you can see it's, most people are raising their hands. And you know, my kids just went through the high school thing and one just finished college. The sad thing is if you, if you look at the research, and the parents are probably going to be mad at me for saying this, but the research really shows is that you're, if your adolescent is focused on what they're doing and passionate about what they're doing and pursues that with a lot of gusto but keeps themselves healthy in the face of that without overly uh, getting stressed out, they're actually going to do well no matter what school they go to and that what college they go to has absolutely nothing to do with anything that happens in their life. How much money they will make, how successful they will be in their careers, their social relationships, or their happiness. Zero. Zero. So, you know, the crucial thing is literally getting in touch with this essence. Your emotional spark, your social engagement, your novelty seeking, your creative explorations. It doesn't mean you just don't do anything. It means you engage in something passionately. Um, so, the, the great news about that study, the great news of that study is we need to take a deep breath and say, do your best, work hard, devote yourself to your studies, but have some perspective about it. Now, here's what I think is going on. We live in a time when, in our modern culture, we are getting exposed to so much stuff. Literally, the bits of information you get streaming into your brain is more than ever before in history. Even in the last five years, how much increase there's been. So we feel this incredible sense of being overwhelmed, number one. Number two, the world is changing faster than it's ever changed. And when I've reviewed this with historians, they say, this is not just a feeling like, oh, things are changing faster, we just feel that way. No, they really are. The world is much more interconnected than it's ever been, and things are shifting, and things are hugely uncertain. And so when you, when you look at this uncertainty, you've got to have a process, for example, that the mindfulness program here at Middlesex teaches or inward bound mindfulness education would teach, this way to actually create a space in your mind. I do it with something called the Wheel of Awareness where tonight you can all go home and go to my website, drdansiegel.com and click on the, the everyday mindsight practices and do the breath practice and try the Wheel of Awareness practice. And what we do, literally, if you think about this wheel, there's an outer rim and an inner hub. And the hub is this sense of knowing, a spacious knowing. And the rim is anything can be known. So in this case, what you would do is you would say, I feel on my rim unbelievable pressure to get a good SAT score. And instead of being lost on the rim, you've developed this capacity to be in the hub, where you go, I see what that pressure is. So you don't just deny it. You acknowledge there's a pressure there. But then I realize, I heard in this talk that it actually, my college I go to and the SAT score I get actually predict nothing. I don't know if you know that. The SAT score you get has nothing to do with even how well you do in school. 
It's amazing. So you go, okay, well, that's another point in the rim. And then you go to another point in the rim which says, hey, I think I'm going to study well, but I'm going to relax. I'm going to have a perspective. These mindfulness kinds of practices, this way of literally integrating consciousness, is what I call it, it gives you this capacity to be flexible. Now, with all of the applause about the, the research study, the good news is that if you as parents feel this way, why are we still worried about it? Well, I think what, what's happening is this. In an uncertain world, the mind really wants to grab onto something that's certain. So if I can say, well, if I get this GPA and I get this SAT score, I will probably get into this college. That college, if I name drop it at a, at a school function, will probably get more looks of, oh, your kid goes to blah, blah, blah. And I got to tell you, I don't know how it is on the East Coast versus the West Coast, because this is true on the West Coast too. But when I went to school, um, you know, people were saying like, well, do you like surfing or do you like skateboarding? You know, not, not like are you at this school or that school. I mean, it was a weird thing in LA. <laughs> it was an anomaly. Um, but this idea of certainty is really what we str we're struggling for. I have a lot of kids in my practice who were pressured to graduate good grades and they got from California, got into fancy schools out here. They come back to continue their therapy. And I'm gonna tell you this, honestly, and they would want me to tell you this. They feel completely empty and completely burnt out. They have no idea who they are and they're busy, busy, still running the rat race, racing for nowhere, which is the name of a great film, um, The Race to Nowhere. Um, and, and this is the whole idea, like why? It's, it's this sort of cultural delusion, delusion is something not consistent with reality, that if I grab something certain, like I got this degree from this place, everything is fine. No, actually that isn't fine. It's just an illusion you went after because you wanted a feeling of certainty. Well, if you let it go, and you let your son or daughter find what truly matters to them, they will pursue that with a gusto and a passion. It will be their own, and they will create the kind of world we need, which is where people really feel strongly about what they're doing and come with an authentic sense of self. That's what mindfulness can give us. That's what literally changing the cultural conversation is all about. At the end of the Brainstorm book, what I do is I say this. I say, look, there are two ways the self is created. The self is created by knowing what your body is feeling, what you're passionate about, but the self is also created in connection. And, and so it's both a me and it's a we. You know, and I used to say from me to we a lot, and people would say, well, from me to we sounds like you're giving up me and just going to we, and I want to have my me, and I don't want to have just a we. And so then I made up this word called we, M-W-E. So I said, you know, if you live life as a we, then you get it all because then you can savor the world and also serve the world. And this is basically how the, the book concludes. You know, all the studies of well-being show that when you're actually doing things in service for other people, you get this deep sense of well-being. So think about if that were really what we were competing with, not with each other to try to get better SAT scores or better grades or better colleges or whatever that means, but actually what if we were competing with the world's problems. And you, yeah, so you have a competitive streak, good. Let's figure out how to stop making the climate boil over. Let's try to figure out how to feed people on the planet. Let's try to how to make this place a healthier world. Let's try to help people get along better. Those are things we can compete with. So if you like to get out on the field and play lacrosse or soccer, whatever you like to do, great. Let's pick an enemy that if we defeat that enemy, everybody wins. That's what we can do. That's a shift in the cultural conversation, right? And that's something we engage in. And it isn't like we say to, say to adolescents or ourselves as adults, you've got to change the world or you've got to improve the world. No, that's too big an issue. All you have to say is we need to serve the world. And at the same time we're serving it, because that you can be in control of, you can be certain of that. You also can savor the world and keep on enjoying it. There's a wonderful poet named Gary Schneider, who is a poet who's been writing for years about our planet. And he says this beautiful thing. He says, don't try to save this planet out of guilt. Save this planet out of love because you love the earth. And that's what we can do. And that's literally creating the love around things. And that love is like candlelight, you know? When you have a candle that's lit and another candle comes to you that's unlit and you light that candle and now you have two candles, what happens to the light of the first one? 
doesn't diminish. It doesn't diminish. This is the kind of world we need to create. There's something called sympathetic joy, which doesn't exist much in the world. What sympathetic joy is, is when you see someone succeed, you get really excited for them. When you see someone happy, you're really happy for them. Think about if we could make sympathetic joy a part of our planet. Everything would turn around. Instead of trying to rip people down, we'd try to be put, put people up. And there's no reason we can't do that. We can do that. We really can. And that's the kind of world we can create. So uh, let's take one more question, and then, or two more here, and then we'll call it an evening. And I'll thank you so much. Yes. Um, thank you for such an amazing talk. And, My uh, pleasure. I swear this isn't a name drop whatsoever. There's a group of us here from the Mind, Brain, and Education Program at Harvard Graduate School of Education. Wonderful. Yay. So, so let me repeat what you're saying. So there's the Mind Brain Education Program at Harvard Ed School of Education, which takes this very seriously and takes um, mindfulness training very seriously. Excellent. Great. A lot of research we've done, but my question is um, more geared towards how can we encourage adolescents to be healthier and more Yeah, so the question is, how can we take advantage of social media to do this? A couple of things to say about that. Number one, please come to a conference that I participate in called Wisdom 2.0. It's in February around Valentine's Day uh, every year uh, in San Francisco. And we bring all the Silicon Valley people who run all those things that are doing all those things. Uh, and they're there. Those people are actually there on the stage and they're there in, in at meal times and stuff like that. And so we try to have exactly that conversation. And so I'm there to, to engage them in all this stuff. And I do work with a lot of those companies trying to really get them involved that way. And I know my colleagues up at UC Berkeley, they're also working with them exactly like that. How do we create more compassion, all this stuff. So we're really trying. And, and I got to say, those folks are completely into mindfulness. Uh, we, Thich Nhat Hanh was just at Google running around with everybody. I just gave a talk at Google. Uh, Facebook is having all sorts of great things happen. At, so I'm very hopeful, knowing the, knowing the individuals who run those programs, that they're really excited to work with you and these general concepts. So, that, so please come to the meeting. The second thing to say is that um, we have to be careful about uh, conclusions about it. I, I once taught in Australia, and I said, yeah, you know, social media it doesn't really involve nonverbal signals much, and I'm really concerned. And someone had just completed a study of 100,000 adolescents. And she showed that, in fact, for her study, uh, you know, that social media increased face-to-face -face time for 80% of the adolescents, but for 20% of them who had social challenges, like anxiety, social phobias, or were on the autistic spectrum stuff, it was much harder for them. So we have to be really specific about the question, like how does social media affect different groups, and how can we try to make it promote more empathy and compassion? I completely agree with you. Thank you for the question. And let's do one more. I think, uh, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. I Thank you. I teach both middle school and high school, and my middle schoolers are very nice kids, um, but they're mean to each other. Yes. They're really, really mean to each other. And I watch them when they get to high school, they get that passion that you talk about, so that becomes their focus. But in the moment when I watch them be, they're really mean to each other and not seem to realize that where does that come in terms of their development and what is so the question is, uh, the person speaking is a teacher who teaches middle school and high school and notices that the middle school kids are a lot meaner to each other, they are mean to each other, compared to the high school kids who've learned to become more passionate and compassionate with each other. Um, and I think that's true a lot. There's, there can be a couple of things to look at. First of all, middle school kids uh, that from, from what parents experience and from what teachers talk about and what you may remember from being that age, it's so full of change in your body starting puberty uh, that there's just feelings of being uncomfortable and unfamiliar and irritable. Uh, and the lower parts of the brain that respond to facial expressions, for example, are much more likely to interpret neutral faces as hostile. And so there's a lot more of that brainstem responsiveness. So teaching kids at that age mindfulness would be a really good thing to do. 
um, teaching them, for example, the, the wheel of awareness practice where they can feel something arising and not necessarily have to react to it. That's the buffer between an impulse and an action that I'll bet you if we did a systematic study, maybe through the Harvard Brain Mind Education Program, we could actually show that this would improve things. Uh, I work at the Garrison Institute in New York, and we actually have a program funded by the, the uh, National Education something. Um, and, and basically, what we, we teach teachers to be more mindful so that they can actually encourage their kids in middle school, for example, to have that kind of presence. Um, but it's a hard time. You know, when your body is changing like that, it feels really new and awkward and uncomfortable, and you don't know exactly how to respond. And so being open to that and, and, and encouraging them to become more aware is a good way to go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Be well and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.